the untold story of war production. All wars are about competition in production. The side that can produce more is always going to triumph. This is a war between the factories. The real story of how the world wars were fought and won. It may sound strange, but modern wars, they're not won by battles. They're won by factories. They swamped the other side with a tide of mass production. And those factories would shape the modern world. And brands like Porsche, Skoda, Rolls-Royce, they all honed their craft on the research and development that was needed to win wars. Gotta get back to work. Think Porsche, and you immediately think of high-performance muscle cars. Porsche is an icon. It's a byword for power, speed, performance. Low to the ground, va 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 voom. It's all about power. When I think of Porsche, I think of fast cars. Boxster, Spider, 911. I mean, these are really iconic cars. So it might come as a real surprise to learn that the father of the Porsche sports car brand was the designer of some of the slowest vehicles in the world. Ferdinand Porsche founded the dynasty that bore his name with his son in 1931. Together they designed the Volkswagen Beetle, the Elephant and the Panzer VIII Mouse the largest tank ever conceived in history. Because during World War II, the father of the muscle car was obsessed with a different kind of muscle, military muscle. Porsche has an obsession with power. And during the Second World War, the German military asks him to design very powerful vehicles. And that will ultimately determine the fate of the German military during the Second World War. Porsche was one of the great disasters for the German war economy. He squandered Nazi resources. These are war-winning vehicles. They just helped us more than they helped them. Looking at his modest beginnings, no one could have predicted that the name of Ferdinand Porsche would become synonymous with speed, power, and massive super tanks. Porsche was born in Maffersdorf, that's near the northern frontier of what is now the Czech Republic. At the time, it was basically part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. He shows an interest in cars, but not as a great manufacturer. One of his first jobs is actually as a driver. Before the First World War, Porsche was Franz Ferdinand's driver. That, by the way, is the Archduke who was shot, the assassination of which was the touch paper for the implosion of the First World War. Porsche's father wants him to take over the family tinsmith business, but the young Porsche has other ideas. He was a boy with his toys, his obsession was the transformative phenomenon of that era, electricity. And it's thanks to him, his family home was the first in their town to actually have electric lighting. And by his 20s, you have the young Porsche being the test centre manager of the electricity firm Bella Egger & Co in Vienna. There, he met a man who would change his life. He comes across a man called Ludwig Lohner, who is one of the early Austro-Hungarian pioneers of coach building. Ludwig Lohner was absolutely convinced there was a market for these electric-powered coaches among the Vienna elite. So what he does is to persuade Porsche to come and work for him. Porsche has the opportunity to now design his first vehicle. What do you get? You get the C2 Phaeton. It's the most extraordinary looking creature you ever did see the first vehicle ever designed by Ferdinand Porsche. It has this really compact electric engine that weighs just 130 kilograms, and it can reach speeds of up to 25 kilometers an hour. 
Once you've charged it, it can putt along for 49 miles and it actually wins a significant road race in Berlin, smashing all the other competitors. Not only was it one of the first vehicles ever registered in Austria, it was also one of the world's first electrically driven cars. And that wasn't the only first that the Porsche Lorna partnership would achieve. Porsche, from the early on, shows that he's an innovator in the industry. He and Lorna pushed forward many of the important firsts in automobile design. Together, these boys cook up one of the first ever front wheel drive cars, your first ever four wheel drive car, and a century before you get your hybrid Toyota Prius, you've got hybrid gasoline electric vehicles, all thanks to Lona and Porsche. By the time he moves on to Daimler in 1906, Porsche was designing racing cars that would go on to win some of the most prestigious competitions in Europe, and often with Porsche himself at the wheel. Not content with world-beating racing cars, Porsche designed a series of military vehicles which saw service in the Austrian army during World War I. The most successful of these was called the Goliath, which was aptly named. It's this huge 10-ton tug with these big cleated wheels, which are almost about a metre and a half across. And what they're designed to do is to drag a massive mortar gun through the mud of no man's land. So it was perhaps the success of this that helped convince Porsche that where military equipment's concerned, bigger equals better. Bigger was certainly better for Porsche's career. There's a great big car merger that takes place in 1926, the fruits of which are still roaring up and down our motorways today. Daimler-Benz, out of which you have the car brand Mercedes-Benz. Porsche was now being backed by Germany's largest automobile manufacturers, which gave him much greater resources and the ability to try out new ideas. And you've got these Mercedes-Benz racing cars designed by Porsche winning the German Grand Prix three years in a row. By 1931, you have Porsche setting up his own design consultancy with his son, Ferdinand Anton, otherwise known as Ferry Porsche. Ferry grows up surrounded by the glamour of these race cars and all this engineering. And he's kind of basking in all this reflected glory of his father's fame. So frankly, it seems only natural for him to inherit some of his father's engineering genius. And it's the alchemy that they produced together from the 1930s onwards, which is gonna be so instrumental for the brand Porsche and of course, for that German war machine. The two Porsches, father and son, would work in tandem from then on, refining Ferdinand's designs. At the same time, they were joined by the third leg in the tripod of talent that would cement Porsche's fame. Carl Raber was an engineer who had worked really closely with Porsche since he had joined Daimler in 1913. And when Porsche goes on to form his own company, Raba comes along and becomes his chief designer. It's a post he's going to remain in until he retires all the way through to 1965. These three together are the brand Porsche, which will be courted by the most powerful men on earth. In 1932, Porsche is visited by this delegation from the Soviet Union. And it's actually Joseph Stalin, no less, who's heard of Porsche's fame, and he wants him to help put the Soviet motor industry on the map. What Stalin does is to ask Porsche to become the general director of the Soviet auto industry. If you look at Ferry Porsche's memoirs, his father does actually consider the offer, but decides that the language barrier would be too much, and he actually turns Stalin down. By then, it was 1933, and Porsche had caught the eye of another rising dictator who was much closer to home, Adolf Hitler. In 1933, 
Adolf Hitler made a speech at the Berlin Motor Show, where he extolled the prowess of German racing cars and vowed to place German automotive excellence at the forefront of his regime. His slogan was full gas forward. Porsche promptly writes to Hitler, compliments the speech, and the two men meet shortly afterwards at the Kaiserhof Hotel. And it's there that Hitler asks Porsche to work with him to promote the German motor industry. He's a player. He's not just an engineer, Porsche. He's a guy with an eye for the main chance. And lo and behold, Hitler invites Porsche to help him put German motors at the centre of his political plans. Porsche wasn't just a brilliant engineer. He was also an astute political operator. So Porsche is like the Zelig of the Nazi automobile industry. If ever there's a photo of Hitler grinning near a car, Porsche is somewhere in the picture with him. They were together through much of the time in the war when you see Hitler inspecting vehicles, Hitler going to certain social events, Hitler doing war maneuvers. Porsche was often there to be seen. Clearly, he liked being around Hitler. He enjoyed being known as Hitler's favorite engineer. His son certainly said that his father was one of only a very small handful of people that could really speak their mind to Hitler. And you cannot dispute that Hitler held Porsche in very high regard. Porsche is determined to establish a relationship with Hitler and the Nazi regime. What he does very early on is he teams up with another German auto conglomerate, Auto Union, to come up with some designs that he hopes to win over the new Nazi dictator. They have two proposals they want to put in front of the Reich's Chancellor. So what Porsche does is to broker a meeting with Hitler where they pitch him with their ideas. The first idea is a car for the people, not just the elite. Everyone, every man on the street needs to be behind a wheel. This is going to be the original Volkswagen. And the second, now that's for a racing team, and that's going to be called the Silver Arrows, and that's made up of Auto Union's really successful racing cars. Who are they designed by? It's by Porsche. Both ideas fitted Hitler's agenda, but there was a catch. Hitler's priority is to have Porsche to work on the Volkswagen. He wants for domestic purposes to show that German industry will create benefits for the people. Porsche actually had been thinking about building a people's car or an affordable family car for years. One of the reasons he breaks with Mercedes-Benz is Mercedes wants to focus on the high-performance, high-end automobile, where Porsche understands that there's a market for the average family to have its own car. And since then, Porsche has been working with a couple of companies, one of which was part of the auto union, to design this two-cylinder car. So when Hitler comes along and proposes that Porsche takes over the Volkswagen brief, he's got no real compunction in ditching auto union and going it alone. Porsche was now free to design the people's car. But as war loomed in 1939, it became increasingly clear that Volkswagen was not being designed purely for the people. The phrase, the people car, is somewhat deceptive. Yes, it was to build a car that could be marketed to the German people and show that the benefits of the Nazi state was providing for them. If you could succeed in making a cheap, versatile vehicle, it would have profound military uses as well. In 1938, you have the German army commissioning Porsche to convert the Volkswagen chassis into this military transport vehicle that should be capable of carrying up to four fully laden soldiers across any terrain. Now, it's very likely this is always the plan and that Hitler had discussed the military applications of the VW design with Porsche from perhaps as early as April 34. But in any case, what's apparent is that Porsche is losing no time in converting the people's car into the German army's equivalent of the Jeep. The result was the Kubelwagen. The Kubelwagen is a remarkable piece of engineering because it provides the German military with an all-terrain vehicle that's extremely rugged and extremely dependable. And so all of a sudden, you basically had a combat beetle. It could go on land and mud, up hills, off-road. The Kubelwagen saw its first action in the invasion of Poland in 1939 
where it proved very successful, except for one tiny detail. The vehicle's slowest reliable speed was about eight kilometers per hour. Well, that's a problem because the average marching speed of the German soldier was about four kilometers per hour. And because of that, the German military ultimately asks Porsche to slow the Kubelwagen down so that those speeds match. Think about that for a second. The German army has taken the greatest race car designer in the country. He's designed this excellent staff vehicle. And what does the German military do? They go, Dr. Porsche, we love it. It's a great design. But could you make it a little bit slower for us? Only in the army could they ask a race car driver to design a slower vehicle. Slowing a car down is not as easy as it sounds. It's about getting the right ratio between the gears and the wheels. And Porsche manages to solve this problem by increasing the size of the wheels and installing a second gearbox, which he calls a reduction box. What this is effectively is a low ratio gearbox, like you're going to find in a modern 4x4. But what Porsche was doing was revolutionary. He was using it in the late 1930s. So once again, he's massively ahead of his time. The Kubelwagen was manufactured in a purpose-built factory at Wolfsburg, which would go on to produce the Volkswagen after the war. The story of the Kubelwagen in production terms is not dissimilar from that of Germany in the Second World War. They make what seems like an impressive number. 50,000 Kubelwagens are produced between 1939 and 1945, and they fight in every theater. The German army uses them for multiple roles, so they seem to be a ubiquitous, important vehicle. On the other hand, when you compare it to, say, the production of the Jeep, they're nothing. There are 50,000 Kubelwagens. There are 660,000 Jeeps built. So there's at least seven Jeeps on the road for every Kubel. It was an imbalance that would be repeated in all spheres of German production. And it would come back to haunt the Nazis as they extended their war into Russia. 23rd of June, 1941. One day after German panzers roll into Russia at the start of Operation Barbarossa. The Germans think they have great vehicles. They move into the Soviet Union with a lot of confidence that they can stand up to whatever the Russians are going to throw at them. They're really not expecting a lot of opposition. Soviet T-26s and the BT tanks are really no match for these German panzers. So you've got to imagine we're surprised when over the horizon rolls this entirely different looking beast. What they're seeing is something that's really sleek, it's fast, it's got this really sloped frontal armor against which the 37 millimeter shells of the German Panzers and the pack anti-tank guns simply bounce off. This beast, it's the T-34. This development sends shockwaves through the Wehrmacht. They very quickly realize we're outclassed by Soviet armor. Soviet tanks, most famously the T-34, proved themselves to be more powerful than Germans expect, and in many cases more powerful than the German tanks themselves. The only thing that saves the Germans was the fact that the Blitzkrieg veterans of Poland and France were able to adapt on the fly and take out the Russians' tank tracks. And what that does is to immobilize them so the infantry can finish them off. But that was only a temporary solution. What the German army and Hitler and Porsche all quickly realize is Germany will need heavier and better tanks. So a rushed program is put into place to develop an entirely new generation of what would have been super heavy tanks at the time. The German tank manufacturer Henschel was commissioned to design a Panzer capable of mounting a gun that could pierce 100 millimeters of armor at a range of 1500 meters. It was assigned the code number VK4501. What Hitler wants is his favorite engineer on this vitally crucial job. And that, of course, is Porsche. But Hitler isn't content to leave this job of cooking up the mother of all tanks to just one man. Hitler did with Porsche and Henschel what he often did, where he sent two people to do the same job to see how one would emerge. 
And so we were left with Porsche and Henschel now in direct competition to build the first new super heavy tank. The race was now on to build the tank that Porsche would name the Tiger. By 1942, Porsche was a commissioned officer in the SS and had been appointed to the main committee of tanks and tractors in charge of managing tank production. So it's only natural that Hitler's going to turn to Porsche in a time of need and to design the tank that for Hitler is hopefully going to turn the tide of war in the Nazis' favor. The Tiger project was not the first time that Porsche had toyed with the idea of a heavy tank. Porsche had actually had an idea for a heavy tank before the war. He had actually started working on plans for what he called a heavy breakthrough tank, which had given the codename Leopard. The problem is with many Porsche's designs is the tank was too heavy and he couldn't actually power it with the engines available at the time. Now Porsche went back to his old plans for the VK4501P Tiger. Time is really short. Carl Otto Sauer, who is Albert Speer's deputy, has decided that the Tiger prototypes have to be ready for a demonstration on the 20th of April 1942. That's Hitler's birthday. So what Porsche does is he dusts off his old Leopard designs, ups the power of its engines, to 640 horsepower. But there was a downside. The weight of these new engines meant that the tank exceeded its required limit by at least 12 tonnes. Hitler doesn't even seem to care. He's already given the green light for production, so by his birthday, they have, like, five prototypes ready to roll. So as far as Porsche is concerned, all he needs is, like, a rubber stamp on the test for one of these five tanks, and everything's going to be great. Much to his surprise, it didn't work out that way. So right from the beginning, it's a disaster. They take it off of its transport, put it on soft ground, and it sinks. It didn't go well for Porsche. His love of the heavy was too heavy. The people from Henschel are nearby, and they offer to Dr. Porsche, would you like us to use our tank to tow yours out? Because his is hopelessly stuck. He politely declines that. It also became apparent that Porsche's ahead-of-its-time design suffered major problems. What Porsche is trying to do with his design of VK4501 is he's to introduce a vehicle with a hybridized transmission system, the transmission system that's making use of electricity as a means of controlling it. And no matter what he does, he cannot get the transmission to work. It was over-engineered and too complex. Karl Rava, Porsche's right-hand man, identified another problem with the prototype, that its coolant behaved in such a way that it made the engines lose power. To fix this problem, the entire engine compartment had to be remodeled and enlarged. Which is why only five chassis had been completed by the date of the first tests. And Porsche's radical new engines required a vast amount of copper. Copper is in really short supply in the Third Reich. Germany itself has no natural reserves of it. Germany could not afford the vast copper usage for Porsche's tanks. They needed the copper for radios, for U-boats, for many other forms of war production. So the whole idea of installing these vast copper coils into two engines for every new tank feels like a really impractical waste of resources. But Hitler didn't give up on his favourite tank. So Henschel wins the contract for the first Tiger, but Hitler still retains his affection for Porsche, and he allows Porsche to continue developing his own version of the super heavy tank. Porsche's Tiger and Henschel's prototype stay in parallel development until a final set of tests. And it's not until that point that it becomes clear that while the Henschel Tiger wasn't much better than the Porsche equivalent, it was slightly more reliable and easier to build. Porsche's Tiger was quietly laid to rest. By then, the remaining chassis initially ordered from Porsche had been completed. 
he decides to take the chassis and find a way to mount Germany's most effective artillery piece, the 88 millimeter gun, on those chassis. And what Hitler wants is the long-barreled 88 to be installed into the Tiger's turret. But no matter how much they modify it, the engineers simply can't make the turret big enough. Now the Nibelungen works was retasked with taking 90 poor chassis, adding 200 millimeters of frontal armor, and surrounding the rear of the tank with an armored box structure that would encase the long-barreled 88. Basically, Porsche's Tiger is no longer a tank. It's actually a self-propelled gun. It's designated the Panzer Jäger and it's nicknamed Ferdinand by Hitler himself in honor of its creator, Ferdinand Porsche. One of the reasons for the intense pressure to build these vehicles so quickly was that they could take part in Germany's summer of 1943 offensive in Russia. The Germans wanted to be able to deploy new heavy armor to give them a hopeful, decisive advantage over smaller Soviet tanks. The Ferdinands were rushed into production, ready for Operation Zitadel, in July 1943, where they had a baptism of fire. What Hitler decrees is that the army group south under General von Manstein are gonna lead the German fight back on the Eastern Front with Germany's new super tanks at the Battle of Kursk. Von Manstein amassed a massive panzer force of more than 2,000 armored vehicles. Contrary to popular belief, this probably only included 117 Tigers, all 90 Ferdinands, and more than 200 brand new Panther tanks. The plan is that the Germans will overwhelm the enemy with these new armored fighting vehicles, that the combination of Tigers, Panthers, and Ferdinands will so thoroughly destroy the enemy that there will be a path of destruction through which the German armor will penetrate the Soviet lines so that they can exploit this breakthrough. Hitler believes these new super heavy tanks will roll over the Soviets, breaking huge holes, being unstoppable, and restarting the march to Moscow. That was Hitler's fantasy. The reality was very different. The German plan goes badly wrong for three reasons. First of all, the super tanks are not deployed in sufficient numbers to make a difference on the battlefield. You've got Porsche's Ferdinands. Now, they're said to have knocked out 320 Soviet tanks at Kursk for the loss of just 13 Ferdinands. That's an amazing kill ratio of more than 20 to 1 but there were 2,700 Soviet armored vehicles at Kursk, and the Soviets are churning out 1,300 T-34s a month. That's the equivalent of three entire German panzer divisions every month. So the kill rate for these super tanks was like trying to plug a hole in a dam. You could stop up one where, but the water would come somewhere else. Secondly, the super tanks are deployed in a way that is inappropriate for the terrain where they're supposed to fight. And that's because the area around Kursk is damp, it's marshy, it's muddy, it's crisscrossed by creeks and rivers. If there's any open ground, it's absolutely peppered with tank traps and more than 400,000 miles. So you've got Hitler's new tanks, but they're so heavy, they're just gonna sink into the mud and none of the bridges over the rivers are strong enough to carry them. The tanks were in many ways designed for fighting in Western Europe on better road systems in actually shorter distances. What Kursk showed is the heavy tank is a brilliant piece of machinery when it fights where it wants to fight, but moving it around and dealing with very difficult conditions instantly led to problems. Thirdly, they simply weren't ready for combat. All these super tanks, they've been rushed to the front without any adequate testing and not enough training for their crews. They were sent into combat so quickly, the Germans only had 20% of the right fuel for them to actually have operations. And the supply of ammunition they had at hand was approximately 40% of what they actually would have needed to fight the battle. Of the 90 Ferdinands that are deployed during Operation Citadel, only 13 of them are lost in combat as a result of enemy action. However, 29 of them 
are lost as a result of mechanical failures. That's a 30% loss rate from mechanical failure. By contrast, the Soviet tanks were much easier to maintain. The Soviets made for them a far better choice. Their tanks weren't as high performance as the German tanks, but they were robust, broke down far less often, had fewer parts that could fail. So they gave up a little bit in performance, but they made up for it in reliability and ability to fight. Out of the 117 Tigers that had begun the Battle of Kursk, only four made it to the final mythic showdown at Prokhorovka. Those four admittedly had a good day. They reportedly shot up to 60 tanks in the Soviet vanguard, and they were also helped by three long-barreled Panzer IVs. But there's a sting in that tale, and it's the Panzer IV. Nobody thinks about the Mark IV, least of all Adolf Hitler. It is the uncelebrated workhorse of German armored fighting vehicles during the Second World War. The truth of the matter is, though, the Panzer IV is the tank that fights for the longest in terms of years, it's produced in the highest numbers, and it's a more robust, reliable tank. The Germans could have built many more Panzer IVs than they wanted to, but Hitler's obsession with the heavy tanks means they're diverting resources. Hitler and Speer shut down two entire workshops that are intended to produce Panzer IVs. Effectively, what they've done by shutting down two workshops for this nonsense is stifle the production of the Panzer IV down to eight a month. And so as a result, the Nibelungen works are only constructing 186 Panzer IVs in 1942, when it was meant to have produced 1,800. So instead of 1,800 reliable, medium-sized tanks that they're supposed to have for the Battle of Kursk, they've got 90 self-propelled guns, 30% of which break down in action. This is just no wonder they lost the war, is it? But even after Kursk, the Nibelungen Works was not allowed to get back to full production. So in the aftermath of Kursk, the Ferdinand doesn't just go away. They take it back, they redesign it a little bit, they put some machine guns on it, they retitle it the Elephant, and they send it to Italy. But Porsche hadn't stopped working on mega tanks yet. Far from it. The fact that Henschel had pipped Porsche to the Tiger contract didn't stop him working on super tanks. He was actively involved in developing the Tiger I into this, the Tiger II, the King Tiger. And originally, the turret was of his design, but it proved to be impractical. However, what he did next was to, in fact, use the same trick he'd used with the Ferdinand. He did away with the turret and replaced it with a single large caliber fixed gun. This became known as the Jagd Tiger. This is the, the Jagd Tiger. Absolutely massive 128 millimeter gun, over seven meters long, an incredibly deadly tank. But there are some problems. If you take this tank off-road, the gun is knocked out of alignment and you have to recalibrate before you can open fire. More importantly, to stop the gun from bouncing up and down and damaging itself, there was a big clip that held it in place. To come into action, somebody has to climb out of that lovely armour and undo it, risking being killed before they even open fire. And very, very importantly, this tank has no turret. That means the engine has to be running and the tank able to move to left to right to engage the enemy. And the transmission is very, very delicate. Well handled, no problems at all. Get it wrong, you stack the transmission, what you've got is tens of tons of useless steel. Once again, Porsche designed a mechanical marvel that suffered major problems. But the biggest was yet to come. In May 1943, Adolf Hitler attended the demonstration of a new tank concept devised by Ferdinand Porsche. At this stage, the tank is just a wooden mock-up 
but it is absolutely enormous. 10 metres long, three and a half metres high, capable of penetrating the front armour of a Soviet tank at three kilometres away. The armour on this vehicle is thicker than the armour on some warships. Porsche calls it the Mammoth, and it is supposed to be unstoppable. Hitler was massively impressed. His tank expert, Heinz Guderian, was not. Show a Nazi a giant tank and he's going to be impressed, unless he's the Nazi's official tank expert charged with overseeing production of panzers and re-establishing supremacy on the Eastern Front. He looks at it and goes, no. He points out in his memoirs that this thing would have weighed 200 tonnes and didn't even have any guns on it to suppress infantry fire. This is a flaw that Paul should have been aware of because it was that lack of machine guns that endangered the Ferdinands at Kursk. So Guderian actually says, except for me, everybody present found the new tank magnificent. Suffice to say, Guderian didn't. But Guderian, the tank specialist, was overruled. Space was carved out of the production schedule for Porsche to work on his latest secret project. The code name it was given, which has to be ironic because it was a massive white elephant and the biggest tank ever, was Mouse. Porsche never let practicality get in the way of his imagination. And in response to Guderian's criticism, he adds a 75mm high explosive gun to the right of the main turret. He thought about putting in a machine gun in the commander's cupola. He even considered putting in a quadruple anti-aircraft gun on the back of the turret. But the main thing about this particular tank is its size. I'm stood next to a Tiger I, and it's at least half as tall as I am, and it's over six metres long. If I bring my other model in, you'll realise that this thing is one and a half times larger than the Tiger, and if we compare it to the sort of tanks that Guderian would have been familiar with in 1939 in his first Blitzkrieg, then one of these actually fits inside the turret of the mouse. Like all of Porsche's tanks, the plan is to have two twin hybrid electric motors powering the vehicle. But even with an aircraft engine powering it, it can barely make 19 kilometers per hour. That's crawling along less than 12 miles an hour. The Mouse was Porsche's most impractical design, which in the history of World War II tanks is quite extraordinary. It was so heavy that in the end, no bridge in Germany could actually bear the weight of a Mouse upon it. So, Undeterred by this, Porsche then invents a snorkel system for his tanks. Now, the idea for that is that one mouse will sit on the riverbank, trailing this cable under the water, which would then power a second mouse driving across the riverbed. One of the mouse's electric motors can be slaved to another. And effectively use one stupid tank to drag the other stupid tank underwater from one side of the river to another so that you don't need a bridge. Never mind the fact that it can only manage a river that's about 20 meters deep. But you know what I love about this is this whole stupid snorkel plan. They never got the chance to try it because by December 1943, they would still only ever built one tank prototype. Basically, there's never going to be a second mouse by a river when you need one. By this point, Albert Speer had quietly pulled the plug on the whole project. Despite this, the development program somehow staggers on until September 44. By May 1945, as Germany was collapsing, two mouse prototypes were thrown into battle in uncompleted form. Only one had a functioning turret, and there are no accounts of it ever having fired a single shot. The Soviets capture both prototypes at the end of the war, and in an attempt to get one that will actually work, they bolt two halves from the two vehicles together, and that vehicle is on display in the Kubinka Tank Museum in Russia today. There's no doubt that the mouse is clearly this joke of a project, and it's a joke that's ultimately on the Nazis. 
In the time it took them to make two stupid mouse tanks, the Soviets made around 35,000 T-34s. Just let that sink in for a moment. These are war-winning tanks, all right. They're just winning the war for the other side. In retrospect, Porsche was one of the great disasters for the German war economy. He took up massive amounts of resources building vehicles that should not have been built, and those that were completed didn't work. Thankfully for us, he squandered Nazi resources. At the end of the war, Porsche was arrested by the French, allegedly for war crimes. I mean, there was plenty of pretext to arrest Porsche on. The French could justify easily his arrest. But it's also pretty clear that the rub behind that arrest was not about holding him to any sort of war crimes account. It's pretty clear they wanted Porsche to design the French equivalent of the Volkswagen in their Peugeot or Renault factories. Ultimately, Porsche gets saved by his son, Ferry. Ferry raised the $62,000 needed to bail his father out of jail by going to work for the Italian racing company Sestalia, making high-powered racing cars. With his father free, Ferry began work on the first official Porsche model, unveiled in 1948. So lo and behold, we have the first car named Porsche, the 356. To make the 356, what Ferry does is to cannibalize parts from the Volkswagen Beetle. The engine, the steering system, and the brakes, they all come from the Volkswagen. And from this, Ferry made something remarkable. In June 51, Ferry's Porsche 356, powered by this modified VW engine, won its class in the Le Mans 24-hour race. It's an absolutely incredible achievement. But his father was not there to see it. Ferdinand Porsche died of a stroke on the 30th of January, 1951. Ferry would take all he had learned working alongside his father since 1931 and turn it into the automotive muscle for his cars. One of the legacies of Porsche's involvement with Daimler-Benz both before and during the war is his adoption of this horizontally opposed cylinder design for his engines. It's known as a boxer because the opposing cylinders hammer the hell out of the crankshaft like a prize fighter. This is the engine that's going to give the muscle to the Porsche 911 and the Porsche Boxster, those iconic cars that are going to make Porsche's name. And the history of Porsche tanks has one final postscript. Yes, brand Porsche does have one more final fling with the tank. Porsche never gave up his love of the tank. In 1958, he was part of a conglomerate that built the first post-war German tank for the West German Army. And it's one of the last projects that Porsche works on before the retirement of its chief engineer, Karl Raber, in 1965. The name of that tank? It was the Leopard. 